Our next speaker is John Pinto, who has just retired after a 25-year career teaching um, at Princeton University, the last 17 of which he was the Howard Crosby Butler Memorial Professor of the History of Architecture. Um, I mentioned earlier he's a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. He was also a longtime trustee of that institution. He's best known for two books, one on the Trevi Fountain and another on Hadrian's Villa and its legacy. The latter won the Book of the Year Award, both from the American Institute of Architects and the Society of Architectural Historians, probably something that doesn't happen terribly often, where the functioning, the, the practicing architects and the historians actually agree on something. Um, he has written extensively on Piranesia over the years in various essays, articles, etc. Um, and Piranesi is also the primary subject of his most recent book, just published this year, which is entitled Speaking Ruins, Piranesi, Architects, and Antiquity in 18th Century Rome. It is uh, out of that book to, that his talk today comes, uh, and it is entitled Speaking Ruins, Fragment, and Fantasy. Please join me in welcoming John to the stage. Thank you very much, John, and um, my thanks to uh, everyone here at the museum. Uh, the organizers, uh, the remarkable group that, uh, that put the exhibition together. It's uh, really a privilege to be part of this. Shortly after his first visit to Rome, Giovanni Battista Piranesi memorably wrote, speaking ruins have filled my spirit with images that accurate drawings could never succeed in conveying. His appreciation of the expressive nature of ruins is telling. So too is the distinction he makes between experiencing ancient architecture directly through on-site examination on the one hand and studying it at several removes uh, by means of measured drawings on the other. His observations present a poetic distillation of over three centuries of reappraisals of the value and meaning of ruins for humanists, antiquarians, and scholars. The contrast between the direct emotional experience of ruins, inspiring flights of inventive fantasy, and the analytical experience of measuring and accurately recording their appearance is characteristic of Enlightenment attitudes towards architecture and archaeology. In the prospectus for the encyclopedia, Diderot pondered the proper place for architecture in his scheme of knowledge wondering whether it belonged under the faculty of reason or that of imagination. The dichotomy between reason and emotion was taken up by Goethe in 1787 while visiting the Greek temples at Pestum. And Goethe wrote, reproductions give a false impression. Architectural designs make them look more elegant and drawings in perspective more ponderous than they really are. It is only by walking through them that one can attune one's life to theirs and experience the emotional effect which the architect intended. Piranesi's comments on the speaking ruins come from the dedication of his first publication, the Prima Parte of 1743, the frontispiece of which appears on the right. Ruins and architectural fragments all reverting to a state of nature surround the dedicatory inscription. Piranesi's portrait by Felice Polanzani, issued in 1750, presents the artist himself as a fragment. Piranesi is depicted in the guise of an ancient bust, the right arm of which is shattered. The edges of the plinth on which the bust appears to stand, with its inscription identifying Piranesi as a Venetian architect, are cracked and eroded by time. A book alluding both to Piranesi's erudition and activity as a printmaker illusionistically projects into the viewer's space. Vine tendrils coil around all of these features, enveloping art in nature. Piranesi's contemporary, Francesco Bianconi, noted the artist's lifelong preoccupation with the theme of ruins and referred to him as the Rembrandt of the ancient ruins, il Rembrandt delle antiche ruine. Just as important as the accurate recording of architectural and archaeological remains is the conjectural leap that gives new life to ruined structures through the restoration of their missing parts. Architects engage in a fundamentally creative act, the design of new forms that will answer the functional and expressive needs of their own time. 
Antiquity has always served as a touchstone and stimulus to new designs. For Piranesi, the past provided a reservoir of forms in support of an essentially creative enterprise. In the mindset of the period, architects could approach the substantive remains of the past with a profound knowledge of history, but without being constrained by their own erudition. It's important to recognize that by engaging in a dialogue with the past in order to design for the present, Piranesi freely participated in a process of decontextualization that other more positivist and philologically inclined disciplines could not countenance. That was all the more true in light of the fragmentary nature of ancient architecture, the physical incompleteness of which invites architects into the ruins. As Leonard Barkin has written of ancient sculpture, and I quote, the more ruined, the more it inscribes. The more it inscribes, the more it invokes the modern imagination. The disiecta membra of ancient architecture aren't deficient, they're open. They admit the historical imagination as a genuinely collaborative force. Piranesi's architectural training predisposed him to relate details and fragments to a governing scheme of design. From Petrarch on, the fact that the artistic and architectural heritage of classical antiquity survived only as fragments and ruins prompted repeated laments upon what was lost. At the same time, however, it was precisely the physical incompleteness that allowed Piranesi and other architects to enter into the surviving works and exercise their creative abilities. Fragmentary structures call out for completion on paper. They provide stimulus to the creative imagination and offer up a vast store of detachable and recombinable images. It was in the 18th century that the fragment may be said to have assumed the status of a distinctive aesthetic category. Increasingly, fragments came to be valued not so much for what they represented of a vanished totality, but for their very incompleteness and associations of decay. Indeed, in the work of artists such as Piranesi or Fuseli, the fragment became a theme in its own right. Fuseli's drawing, which you see here, dates from 1778, the year of Piranesi's death. Piranesi's invocation of speaking ruins calls out for closer examination. Piranesi's remarks underscore several key aspects of his relationship to the physical remains of ancient architecture. While Piranesi was by no means the first to whom the dilapidated monuments of classical antiquity spoke, his emphasis on the emotive power of the ruins is significant. Of equal importance is the stress Piranesi places on the fundamentally creative role played by the ruins in stimulating his imagination. In what follows, I'll explore the creative dimension of Piranesi's engagement with antiquity, with particular emphasis on his response to the fractured remains of Roman architecture. A great deal has been written about Piranesi's manipulation of scale, which perhaps more than any other single aspect of his art contributed to the compelling vision of ancient architecture he fashioned. Goethe first experienced Rome through engravings, probably by Piranesi, which inevitably conditioned his experience of the actual monuments. He was acutely, he, Goethe, was acutely aware of scale, remarking of the Colosseum that, and I quote, it is so huge that the mind cannot retain its image. One remembers it smaller than it is, so that every time one returns to it, one is astounded by its size. Other visitors found Piranesi's manipulation of scale to be misleading. A case in point is a 1792 entry in a travel journal written by William Forbes. As he approached Rome along the Via Cassia, Forbes encountered the so-called Tomba di Nerone. After discussing its popular identification as Nero's sepulcher, Forbes remarks, and I quote, there is a view of it by Piranesi, but by his drawing, we should suppose it to be much more lofty than it really is. The print Forbes had in mind is one from the third volume of the Antiquita Romane, in which Piranesi conveys the impression of monumentality primarily by the diminutive figures of rustic goat herds clambering about the base of the sarcophagus. These appear to be somewhat smaller than the Dioscuri, these figures here, uh, somewhat smaller than the Dioscuri flanking the inscription, while in actuality, 
the sculpted figures are less than half the height of their human counterparts. Two vedute representing the Pantheon illustrate Piranesi's manipulation of scale, both within a single image and between images. In Piranesi's view of the Piazza della Rotonda, he emphasizes the obelisk to such an extent that it appears to tower over the surrounding buildings, including the Pantheon, when in reality, this feature could comfortably pass, finial and all, under the columns supporting the portico of the Pantheon. The other veduta, isolating the Pantheon, emphasizes the temple's dominant presence, looming over the modest houses visible to its sides. It is as if the monument had sucked into its ample rotundity all the space surrounding it and drawn the puny structures of the modern city close to its corrugated exterior, diminishing them through proximity. As if this were not enough, Piranesi places tiny figures on the dome exterior. As if to recall Amienus Marcellinus' characterization of the Pantheon as, quote, like a rounded city region, a simile reinforced by the actual ascent to the oculus. Piranesi's manipulation of scale functions not only illusionistically within the composition, but also concretely in terms of the dimensions of the copper plates and paper stock he used. Piranesi's vedute are significantly larger in size than the prints of his Renaissance predecessors. Over time, Piranesi experimented with formats of increasing size and complexity, ranging from double folio plates to large fold-out maps composed of multiple plates and extended horizontal compositions, such as the plan of Hadrian's villa, which you see here. Piranesi's exploitation of unorthodox viewpoints is closely related to his manipulation of scale, both of which are evident in a plate from the Antichità Romane depicting the foundations of Hadrian's mausoleum. In fact, the point of view is not only unorthodox, but impossible. No excavation of such depth had ever been undertaken, and the pilings and rusticated buttresses cast into relief by Piranesi's raking light are entirely conjectural. What is most significant for our purposes, however, is the way in which the low viewpoint chosen by Piranesi serves to magnify the apparent size of the structure. William L. MacDonald has vividly likened this effect to that of seeing the bow of an ocean liner from a rowboat. Piranesi also made repeated use of elevated viewpoints, as in his Veduta of the Baths of Titus, to tie together more or less isolated fragments into architecturally meaningful compositions. To a degree unprecedented in earlier bird's eye views, Piranesi's choice of an elevated viewpoint, together with the two-point perspective of the Scena per Angolo construction and his brilliant use of framing, heightens the viewer's awareness of the ruins as an architecturally coherent and fully integrated totality. Piranesi's close attention to the materials employed in Roman architecture is familiar, but no less significant for that. It emerges most explicitly in analytic plates, such as this section through the Mausoleum of Augustus from the Antichità Romane. Below the section, shown as if pinned up on a wall, are details of the mausoleum's opus reticulatum masonry, including the sharply foreshortened close-up of the individual tufa blocks at the left. Of course, Piranesi's sensitivity to the material qualities of Roman architecture has an artistic as well as a didactic purpose. Richly textured passages of Roman masonry appear to leap off the page in many of the vedute, such as the one depicting the so-called Tempio delle Tosse below Tivoli. The precise rendering of alternating courses of tufa blocks with bricks, or opus listatum, at the lower right illustrates materials specifically noted in the accompanying caption. Piranesi's attention to the material components of Roman architecture was complemented by his parallel interest in its structural dimension, including the engineering and construction techniques employed by the ancients. No doubt his early experience observing the construction of breakwaters and other hydraulic engineering in the Venetian lagoon, perhaps in the company of Matteo Lucchesi, his uncle who served as an engineer in the Magistrato delle Acque, was formative. Over time, Piranesi came to equate Roman engineering with architectural magnificence. 
as in this print of the Cloaca Maxima from his De la Magnificenza of 1761. Other images present conjectural recreations of the construction techniques and machinery employed in erecting Roman buildings, such as the tomb of Cecilia Metella. The emphasis on mechanical devices and their relationship both to a process and to a final product calls to mind contemporary prints illustrating pre-industrial procedures in Diderot's encyclopedia. Another of Piranesi's contributions as an interpreter of Roman architecture was to recognize and exalt its spatial dimension. Before Piranesi, most representations of Roman architecture were constructed in such a way as to keep the viewer at a distance, on the outside, looking in. For the most part, however, the space molding qualities of Roman imperial architecture were neglected in favor of compositions that either reduced interiors to flat projections or to sections served up as through a transparent seat, as though a transparent seat of, sheet of glass separated the observer from the flayed and dissected edifice. Piranesi, in contrast, was acutely sensitive to the powerful effects of envelopment that came from actually entering Roman spaces especially those generated by central plans. His early experience with theater design, on the one hand, and his abiding interest in architectural fantasies, on the other, both evident in plates from the Prima Parte and the Carceri series, naturally inclined him to respond to the rich spatial complexity of Roman interiors. Two of the late vedute, representing vaulted spaces at Hadrian's Villa, reveal how Piranesi encourages the observer to view Roman architecture directly from within, thus heightening the immediacy of the experience. In his print, representing the main hall of the larger baths, the composition is framed by a shadowy barrel vault, the foreground extension of which appears to cover the observer. At the same time, the orthogonals draw him into the space. Within the main hall, the space is brilliantly defined by the overarching forms of the broken cross vault and the delicate natural swags of hanging vines that artfully fill in masonry gaps. In Piranesi's view of the axial extension of the so-called Serapeon, the curve of the hemicycle anchors the composition on the right, effectively embracing the observer and situating him under the hooded vault. The pronounced foreshortening and dramatic chiaroscuro effects of the receding corridor lead the viewer's eye away from the space he seems to occupy and back to the niche in its terminal concavity. The organic process of decay, together with the cannibalistic recycling of ancient building materials into modern edifices, inevitably revealed the underlying structural features of Roman buildings making visible aspects of these monuments that were never intended to be seen. The analogy between ruined architecture and the flayed human body is evident in a woodcut from Andreas Vesalius's 1543 treatise on anatomy, appropriately entitled De Humani Corpus Fabrica. As an interpreter of Roman architecture, Piranesi was uniquely qualified to exploit the tension between a contextual view of the ruins embedded in the fabric of the living city and a more analytical view, which freed them from the obscuring accretions of later centuries. This tension is evident in a comparison between Piranesi's Veduta of the Porticus of Octavia and his presentation of the same edifice in the Campo Marzio volume. In the Veduta, which you see here, the ancient portico is depicted as an architectural palimpsest, replete with later additions, including the arch substituting for its two missing columns and the abutting oratory of St. Andrew of the fishmongers. In the Campo Marzio plate, however, we see the portico freed from these later encumbrances, standing isolated, but also maintaining its ruined appearance. This presentation, which lays bare the ancient walls, surgically flaying them, is distinct from restoration, as can be seen by comparison with a plate from the Antiquita Romane, in which the portico remains unobscured by later structures, but has its missing features provided in a different line weight, and you can see that here. Piranesi's profound sensitivity to Rome's layered topography and its contextual richness so evident in his multiple representations of the Porticus of Octavia, 
intersects with his historical imagination, always alert to the dual axes of time and space. Nowhere is his attitude more evident than in the Campo Marzio volume, which brilliantly combines visions of the past observed through a range of architectural lenses. One fold-out print offers a scenographic view of the Campus Martius, with all post-classical buildings removed. The monuments that are shown appear in their ruined state, standing isolated in a barren landscape. Other prints from the same volume chronicle the development of the Campus Martius at key points in its history. But these are reconstructions, as is the culmination of the narrative, the dazzling ichnographia, which you see here. Each of Piranesi's several modes involves substantial, if differing, measures of conjecture, just as they may be said to draw, in differing degrees, upon literary and material evidence. Each has the ability to move observers in a variety of ways. Consider two presentations of the Pons Aelius and the Mausoleum of Hadrian. One, in which we see the two structures shorn of all post-Hadrianic accretions, is strangely ahistorical transporting us out of our own time into a nether world in which modernity ceases to exist, but antiquity is not restored. The other, a bold conjectural re uh, reconstruction in which the multi-tiered mausoleum rises like Bruegel's vision of the Tower of Babel, takes us back to antiquity, but through a distorting visionary lens that engages as much with the future as it does with the past. Piranesi's veduta depicting the octagonal hall of the smaller baths at Hadrian's villa is a tour de force of architectural rendering, but it is also a prime example of how he viewed the ruins as engaged in an epic and unending battle with the forces of nature. Piranesi had spent decades observing Roman architecture and distilling its essence on the etched plate. With his unparalleled mastery of composition, light and shade, he brilliantly renders the undulating masonry envelope that molds this centralized space. Piranesi's interpretive talents suit him, or are, are especially suited to the organic nature of the structure, the walls of which appear to pulse with movement, while its vaults arch upwards like the boughs of mighty trees meeting in an airy crown of foliage. It is no coincidence that the mid-18th century saw the construction of the first artificial ruins, usually as garden ornaments, where the organic processes of growth, decay, and mortality are clearly manifest. There are also instances of new buildings shown reverting to a state of nature, as in the crumbling corner pilaster of the Fontana di Trevi. In 1760, Hubert Robert sketched the Trevi just as it was being completed, and yet, his inclusion of a creeper in the foreground recalls his abiding interest in the organic growth and decay of great architectural monuments and the civilizations that created them, a theme that is expressed in many of his paintings. Throughout Piranesi's graphic work, the artist plays virtuoso variations on the theme of the fragment. An image from Piranesi's Campo Marzio volume representing, the diminutive, representing diminutive figures clambering about a colossal block of the fallen frieze of Aurelian's Temple of the Sun, makes no effort to reconstruct the fragment or integrate it into the structure it was once a part of. These concerns are addressed by analytical illustrations that immediately follow. At the same time, we can identify numerous cases in which fragments are the focus of attention and even become at once the generating force and the raison d'etre of entirely new artistic creations. Piranesi's intellectual, artistic, and commercial enterprises were founded on fragments, architectural, sculptural, and graphic. Nowhere is this more evident than in the remarkable objects exhibited in his house museum in the Palazzo Tomati, many of which were depicted and thus advertised in his 1778 publication, Vasi, Candelabri, e Cippi, a page from which you see here. As a dealer in antiquities, Piranesi specialized in such ornamental objects, avoiding the more competitive and problematic market for figural sculpture. It was standard practice for Piranesi, Hamilton, Jenkins, and other dealers to restore missing portions of the works they offered for sale. Many specialists in restoration flourished in Rome, 
Piranesi employed the best, including Lorenzo Cardelli and Francesco Antonio Franzoni. According to Piranesi's biographer, Legrand, Piranesi trained these men, providing them with models he made himself. Vincenzo Brenna, writing to Charles Townley in 1770, remarked that Piranesi has amassed a large collection of marbles that, in addition to having filled up his house, he has taken over a great many shops in his street, the Strada Felice, that are also full. He employs 30 people to work on the marbles. He has almost ceased etching and has thrown himself into the traffic in ancient marbles. As a result of all of this activity, Piranesi came to be called Cavalier Pasticci and Cavalier Candelabri. <laughs> Both the expectations of 18th century collectors and the prerogatives of the dealers who catered to their taste far exceeded the bounds of appropriate restoration procedures today. Their aim was a seamless, apparently intact object, and to this end they were prepared to supply missing parts and provide surfaces and patina virtually indistinguishable from the original fragments. This could and often did involve considerable flights of inventive fantasy, especially by restorers guided by Piranesi's authority and creative genius. Such fantasy is evident in the Trentham labor, fashioned from fragments found at Hadrian's Villa, and uh, which you will see in the exhibition, uh, wonderfully reproduced uh, by Factum Arte. Objects such as these shed light on Piranesi's attitudes towards restoration and the dynamic relationship between fragments and fantasy. Among the most striking are the two candelabra of the Arsmolian Museum and the so-called Warwick vase on display in the Bureau Collection in Glasgow. The Oxford candelabra were purchased from Piranesi in 1775 by the connoisseur Sir Roger Newdigate. Two years later, Newdigate presented them to the Radcliffe camera where shortly after their installation, they were described as constituting, and I quote, a perfect school in themselves of sculpture and architecture. The candelabra are triangular in plan and just under two meters tall. They are extremely complex and richly ornamented. The one shown here has as its principal sculptural component three cranes set on its corners. When the surfaces of the candelabra are examined closely, it's evident that they are composed of hundreds of fragments joined with great skill. It is equally evident that by far the majority of these fragments are not ancient, but 18th century creations. The Warwick vase takes its name from George Greville, Earl of Warwick. Greville acquired this magnificent object from Sir William Hamilton, British ambassador to Naples, who had purchased it from Piranesi, arranged for its repair, and brought it to England in 1774. The condition of the vase close, re, closely resembles that of the two Oxford candelabra in that it is a brilliant pastiche, for many of the fragments date from the 18th century and are of a remarkable quality. An account of Piranesi's restoration methods stresses the, in, the integration of new passages with original fragments. And I quote, being discovered in pieces, an artist at Rome formed a mass of clay of its shape and dimensions, and fixing the pieces together by adhesion to the clay, united them afterwards more formally and supplied the deficient masks. Piranesi's claims in the Vasi Candelabri et Cipi for many objects he offered for sale appear willfully to misrepresent them as substantially intact works of ancient art. The caption below one of the plates illustrating the Warwick vase is a case in point. The vase is cited as an example of, quote, the perfection of the arts in the age of Hadrian. A detail from the same plate, apparently chosen to illustrate the refinement of the antique carving, depicts the acanthus leaf decoration at the base, which in fact contains no surviving ancient fragments. The Oxford candelabra and the Warwick vase express Piranesi's remarkable vision of antiquity as much as they reflect the age of Hadrian. Because of Piranesi's brilliant improvisations, these objects have assumed great significance for the history of art. Piranesi's engagement with the ancient marble plan of Rome, the Forma Urbis Romae, extended throughout his career and represents an important theme within his publications, both archaeological and polemical. The Forma Urbis ranks among the most remarkable city representations of any epoch. 
The plan was incised on marble slabs early in the third century during the reign of the Emperor Septimius Severus. The slabs were originally affixed to a wall in the annex of the Temple of Peace. As the surviving fragments of the marble plan clearly demonstrate, every street, square, and building is delineated in outline as a ground plan. Every topographical feature is drawn as if reflected on a single horizontal plane. Modest buildings, such as the three atrium houses visible here, see those, one, two, three, uh, receive the same care and attention to detail accorded to monumental structures like the Circus Maximus. An impressive demonstration of the Roman surveyor's art, the Forma Urbis provides a coherent framework into which details could be inserted without compromising the overall image of the city. In the 18th century, a development occurred that rekindled interest in the marble plan, fragments of which had been discovered in 1562. Pope Benedict XIV acquired the surviving fragments from the Farnese family and arranged for their transfer to the newly formed Capitoline Museum. Significantly, Piranesi was engaged to consult on their display. The publication of the Antiquità Romane in 1756 heralded a more systematic and archaeological approach, evident henceforward in Piranesi's antiquarian studies. Around the edges of a plan from the Antiquità Romane, recording the principal monuments of ancient Rome, a selection of fragments from the Forma Urbis appear. Closer scrutiny reveals that Piranesi's own plan is illusionistically represented as if inscribed on a large slab of marble. Shadows cast by the fictive slab along the lines of the walls on the geniculum signal the illusion. The implications are clear. Piranesi's new plan emerges from the old, which he values as an important archaeological document bearing on the topography of the ancient city. Other plates uh, of the Antiquità Romane provide reconstructed plans of monumental complexes of the ancient city, presented as if they were inscribed on fragments of the Forma Urbis, such as this one, reconstructing the Forum and the Palatine. Piranesi played upon the conventions of the marble plan in yet other ways. One of the plates of the Antiquità Romane represents a ground plan of the Church of Santa Costanza and the funeral complex of which it is, was a part. The central plan church appears at the top of the plan with an oblong open-air cemetery set at right angles to it. Balancing the church on the opposite side of the cemetery is a remarkable circular staircase, recalling Baroque stage design far more than it does any stair known from antiquity. All of these structures are shown as if inscribed on a marble slab, which has a diagonal line of fracture running through it, effectively dividing the church and one arm of the, of the cemetery from the staircase and the other cemetery arm. This fracture line initially appears to be arbitrary, but in fact it neatly separates the verifiable remains from the conjectural parts, notably the stair. The conjectural nature of the reconstruction is further reinforced by different line weights, as noted in the caption. Piranesi employs the conventions of the marble plan not merely to separate archaeological fact from imaginative fiction, but to signal his dual role as antiquary and designer. The inspiration for the staircase design has been traced back to a feature inscribed on the real marble plan. Piranesi's additions to the Santa Costanza complex introduce symmetry and balance where there was none, enforcing design principles and expectations of the 18th century. In the Santa Costanza reconstruction, one sees anticipated and compressed the logic that explodes in Piranesi's visionary iconographia of the Campus Martius, filled with countless structures suggested by the conventions of the marble plan. In this remarkable image, a composite of six plates, Piranesi pursues the illusion of a plan inscribed on marble several steps further. Metal clamps appear along the edges, suggesting that Piranesi's plan, like the Forma Urbis, is affixed to a wall. The upper right-hand corner has apparently been broken off and subsequently rejoined to the main slab. In the Ichnographia of the Campus Martius, Piranesi reintegrates the fragments of antiquity into a visionary totality. In Piranesi's archaeological mode, the fragments are used as documents. In his visionary mode, however, they function as metaphors, 
There is no discernible difference between the fictive fragment of the plan at the upper right and the real fragment of the forma urbis that appears just to the right of the dedicatory plaque. Thus, Piranesi's vision of Roman grandeur takes its inspiration from the abstract geometrical conventions of the forma urbis. The fragmentary state of the real marble plan both legitimates and stimulates the fantastic configurations of his lapidary vision. While the ruins certainly spoke to Piranesi, we must also grant that the relationship was reciprocal. He succeeded in giving the ruins their own distinctive voice with unprecedented range and timbre, capable at once of staccato precision and highly expressive coloratura passages that command respect and admiration. The ruins, through Piranesi's graphic work, took on a new expressive role as a form of speaking architecture or architecture parlante, which culminated in his late archeological publications. From Piranesi's direct experience of fragmentary and ruined monuments in Rome, he fashioned a rich and compelling vision of the ancient world. The ways in which antiquity spoke to him produced novel visual vocabularies that responded both to surviving remains of classical architecture and to the unrealized potential within the ruins. To paraphrase Sir John Soane, Piranesi came to be intimately acquainted with not only what the ancients have done, but endeavored to learn from their works what they would have done. For Piranesi, the fragmented remains of ancient Rome were at once a point of reference, a creative base, and an inspiration. Thank you. <laughs>